I, I can't say that I picked this task and it's somewhat daunting to come before you now and say I've got the solution to the future of journalism for you. So um, I apologize if I don't live up to that. Um, let me just say this is a great strategy. You know, so you're organizing a conference. It's the very end of the day. You've kept people in the room for six, seven hours. You've seen Cy Hirsch. You've been entertained by a hip hop acapella group. That's how you think, how can I captivate you know, an audience? I'm going to bring an American sociologist. You know, this is a... <laughs> so, so I've got a lot to, to work on here, but I'm going to try to hold your attention for 20 minutes or so and make you feel like you didn't make a bad decision at the end of the day. <laughs> I'm going to start with a story, which is a little bit um, connected to what Mark said. So I'm not actually a journalist. I'm a sociologist. And I also run the graduate program at New York University. And for the last several years, something amazing has happened. I've gotten a series of calls, emails, and formal applications from high-level journalists in their 20s and 30s. I'm not talking about people in journalism school. I'm talking about people who have elite jobs at the best magazines and newspapers, people who've been nominated for national magazine awards, people who've written important, influential books that have been widely reviewed, and gain much acclaim. And they say this, Professor Kleinenberg, I don't think I can have a career in this profession anymore. It, it's not viable. Mm. People around me are drowning. I am scrambling and working too hard to get too few stories out. I need to find something to do. Do you think it's too late for me to go into academia and get a PhD? This is going to be great for the social sciences. <laughs> Ten years from now, you're going to have even better sociologists to bring here. This is a real danger for journalism, right? Because the danger is that Cy Hirsch today doesn't go into journalism. Journalism is a public good, right? And, and we talk about the big deal investigations, and we've had a lot of conversations today about the high-profile pro investigations, so we know the good it does when you get inside of the world of Abu Ghraib or the meatpacking industry or the fisheries. But I put this California Watch thing here for another reason, which is that a lot of the public good that journalism does happens at the state and local and regional level with boot leather reporting that tells us what happens in institutions where there are powerful people making important decisions. Um, allocating resources. It happens if you can get inside the private sector, which is very difficult to do. It's a public, journalism's a public good in a very special way also. And that's why I have this photograph on the other side. There's one guy there reading a newspaper. The other two people in the image could care less about what's going on in the newspaper. But they too benefit from the fact that he's reading that newspaper. Right, because if enough people are consuming journalism, to pay for journalism to be produced, you then are funding collectively eyes on the ground who are putting a check on government officials or people in the private sector. And even if you never pick up a newspaper, you benefit from that. So when there's a problem in the market for media, when there's a market failure in the media system, and I suggest that there is a market failure in the media system, it's not just the people who love the newspaper who pay. We all pay. I'm going to try to tell you only things that you already know, or don't know in this talk, uh, so I'll skip some things. But the, the devastation of professional journalism is something that's now well understood. It's, we talk about it with foreign correspondents. I'm focusing on the, the city hall desk and the stateroom desk, right? And it's happened at a very bad time. In the United States, as in many other parts of the world, this kind of rise of what, whether you call it neoconservative or neoliberal, market-based governance has meant a lot of consequential action about economic policy happens at the local level. Devolution means a lot of things happen in state houses in the United States, for instance. And consequential bills started going through the state house at the very moment when American media started pulling their state house reporters out of the state houses. Right? This is not, these are not reporters who are getting you Cy Hirsch kinds of stories. They're just getting you stories about 
bills and political fights over things like zoning and funding for various projects um, in all industries, and we, don't, we know much less about it today. There's an enormous amount of enthusiasm about civic journalism, um, uh, amateurs who can provide stories that pr previously we could only get from professional journalism. Unfortunately, we have very little record of civic journalism going into places like this, where actually it's pretty boring. I don't know that I need to say much about this, but this is, the, this, is the, this is why we're here, right? This is why we're here. So um, David Carr, who's the media reporter for the New York Times, he does a media column. He uh, wrote this terrific piece about Gannett uh, a couple weeks ago that was referred to before. Gannett, when the CEO who just left took over, had 52,000 employees. The largest, it's the company that owns the largest number of daily newspapers in the United States. It also puts out the USA Today. The strategy has been to go into media markets around the country. They've taken on many lawsuits about anti-competitive practices to try to drive the, the local paper out, the other competitors out, so they establish a monopoly. Once they get the monopoly, slash the number of journalists who are there, in the years that the de recently departed CEO was in his position, they cut the staff from 52,000 to 32,000 across the company. The share value dropped from $75 a share to $10 a share. When the CEO left, he was paid in addition to his multi-million dollar salary and severance package, given a $37 million package of retirement benefits. And this is an issue about the media industry. On the one hand, there's no money for reporters. On the other hand, as it's become part of the broader marketplace, we've seen in some countries CEOs take home tremendous amounts of money, entire boards making a lot of money, executive leadership making a lot of money that's not going into journalism. And it's something we should talk about. Carr said, bizarrely, at the end of this column, which was full of stories about journalists losing their job in this new media market, that we've entered into a new golden age. It's not totally bizarre, we kind of get it. Mark hinted at some of this. There's all sorts of interesting and entrepreneurial things happening online. The rise of multimedia means journalists can do things that they couldn't do before. I want to talk a little bit today about some of those new models and I also want to talk about some techniques that journalists can use to make better use of technology that's available and, that res uh, and resources that are out there right now. But I think we need to be very careful about this rhetoric a new golden age. The fact that some journalists can do this does not mean this is a golden age for journalism as an institution. This is a perilous moment for journalism as an institution. I might come out where Cy and others do, which is someday journalism should be able to revive. But right now, it's, gonna, it's a tough time, and we could be in a tough time for a long, long period. One thing that we've seen a lot of with the decline of professional reporters is the rise of opinion. And one of the strange things about the internet is it spawned a culture in which everyone believes not only that they're entitled to their own opinion, but also that they're entitled to their own facts. And the internet can provide you with your own facts. So increasingly, uh, the role of a professional journalist is to interpret Right, to evaluate, to give you some sense of what's meaningful and reliable and what is not. What's driven changes here, I'm going to go quickly because you know about this. Part of this is a um, cyclical story. Um, a lot of the talk of crisis in the last several years, the reason so many of us have been going to, conver to conferences like this, having conversations about the state of the industry, is because the economy has gotten so bad. And some of this really is cyclical. This will turn around. There's been a dramatic decline in advertising for many media, but that won't last forever. The economy will turn around, and it's important to, to, to note that. But some of it is secular, right? Some of this is structural. So if you think that circulation of the printed newspaper is gonna come back sometime soon, you need to wake up. 
This is an unlikely scenario. That doesn't mean there aren't ways for newspapers, newspaper companies to make money, but probably delivering a printed paper to your doorstep is not going to be the thing that does it 10, 20, 30 years down the line. No. Right. So the secular change, the structural change, is this transition from print to digital. I'm not going to go on about this. You know this. This has a specific implication that I think we have not discussed adequately today. It's about the fact, and I think it's the answer to this, this interaction we just had between Mark and I, I don't know your name in the back, Francisco. Why is it that the newspaper industry has struggled so much with this? The business of the newspaper has changed in a way that's profound. It's not just about the medium changing, the switch from the printed paper to digital. It's partly that. It's also that the newspaper as a product is internally diverse. There's hard news, there's soft news. There are light features, lifestyle stories, sports, cartoons, gossip, celebrity stories, advertisement, opinion. The newspaper contains all these different kinds of things. And for the history of the newspaper, the economic model was, was not simply that it was print delivered to you. It was that the profitable parts that had high demand because they were entertaining subsidized what would have been the less profitable and more expensive parts, the lost leaders, right, which at times played a key role in the economy of the newspaper. There's something serious and important happening. Your country's going to war. There's an election. There's a political crisis of some kind. There's certain moments at which those stories drive large demand, but not always. But there's always demand for that lighter stuff because it's entertaining. The newspaper as a product subsidized the production of hard news, which was a lost leader. Is that Clear? That's totally ended. And what happens in a world where we go online is that we click on individual stories. We don't click, we, we don't click on the New York Times in general, a little bit, but basically what we're doing is we're clicking on stories. And every media company knows which stories people are clicking on and which stories people aren't clicking on. So here's the danger. I, I want to refer back to the last presentation on marketing and the Harry Potter stuff because I found that frightening. The, co the consequence of that world, it, the world where news companies, where journalistic organizations and individual journalists are concerned about how to build their own cloud. They want to win eyeballs in an attention economy. That's a world in which entertainment values trump news values because you can't compete with cute kitties. You can't compete with porn. You can't compete with celebrities. You can't compete with lifestyle. If you're doing news from the state house, news from city hall, you will always lose that. And so the danger, not, not every day, but over time. Not every day, but over time. So, so this, is a th this is a threat to journalism. It's a threat to hard news production. You know how much money it costs to do a beat at the State House, and you know how few people are reading it. And it's clearly like a calculus like that for investigative reporting. Now think back about that slide with the guy reading the newspaper and the women talking, and my point that journalism is a public good because it provides benefits even for people who aren't reading, right? There's a social value to that kind of journalism that exceeds its market value. And newspapers, for a time, were able to provide multiple values, including a lot of money. But the threat now is that that's going to be difficult to sustain, right? There's, that's what I mean by market failure. Before I get to this, let, let me say one other thing. I, I've made this position before about the value of public media. I understand that the corruption of public media at times. I understand the ways in which public media can go wrong. I understand that 
public media writ large is not the answer to our problem. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. When you see something that's going wrong in a publicly funded media system, the question should be, how do you make a public, public media system work better? What are the places that do it well? What are the institutions that do it well? What are the things that go wrong recurrently? And how can we learn from those things? Let me tell you, as someone who's lived inside the United States for a long time and who's written a lot about the media system in the United States, you don't want to live in a media system where there's $4 per capita spending on public media. Let me say that again. You don't want to live in a media system that looks like the United States one does. That's not the media that you want. I guarantee you that. Right? If you're concerned about the $50 per capita, think about how you can work together as professional journalists to improve that spending rather than getting rid of it. Because if professional elite journalists in places like this start to make the case against public media, mm. then it's really in trouble. Is it secular or cyclical, this trend in free? I think it has to be cyclical. It has to end. This information isn't free and it can't be free. And it's notable that the New York Times has had some success putting up a, a paywall. And I think other, and the Wall Street Journal has for a long time. Other organizations are going to have to do this. There are all sorts of creative ways to do it. It's not a Manichaean <coughs> division between free and paid, but it can't just be free. Okay, so let me just talk a little bit quickly, because I'm aware of the time, about some new models for doing things differently that I think are interesting. I'm not going to say much about them. Maybe we can talk about them in the Q&A. I just want to throw out the idea that there, there are some things we can discuss. So, you know, the foundations and nonprofits have, have come up. I knew ProPublica would come up. Correct. It's actually interesting. Some people mentioned the Fund for Investigative Journalism. <clears throat> I didn't realize that um, the $250 grant that they gave you, Sai, helped to make your early reporting in Vietnam possible, but they make a lot of it, and they should. Foundations are terrific and have done incredibly innovative work. I hope to see more of them making up for this market failure I described. Foundations are a sliver and not a plank. They are not going to solve the problem of dealing with this gap. In the United States, they are tiny. In Europe, they have a long way to go as well. So it's important to note the ones that are good and to see what they're doing well. But let's not get carried away thinking that foundations are going to solve the problem. One of the issues with these foundations is that they tend to follow the interests of the funders. And the big funders who have resources to throw into investigative journalism, this kind of research, oftentimes want to make a big impact at a national level. So there's a danger here that, first of all, the local and regional stuff, which is really what's gotten devastated during this downturn, are still going to be ignored. And frankly, when the cosmopolitans of the world come together to talk about the media, they tend not to talk about the local and regional stuff. They talk about the national stuff, and that's a mistake. And second of all, funders have their own interests. Whether it's the Koch brothers, you know about the Koch brothers? The, the, the funders of the Tea Party? Right? Or Soros, who's funded me. Thanks, Uncle George. Um, funders have their own interests. And we can't think that funders are going to go into this space and be innocent actors who are purely interested in the public good and who will allow reporting that goes anywhere. Because when it cuts too close to home, as good reporting inevitably does, right, because that's its responsibility, it's going to get tricky. So yes, foundations, I'm with you, Mark. That's, they're one of 50 solutions, but they're not the solution, and there isn't one. I've made this point before. I wanted to show somehow the public investment in the BBC compared to the you know, public investment in the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in the United States, but I couldn't get that icon small enough. Please don't walk away thinking that public media should not be part of the solution. What are some things that could be done? So I've been pitching in the United States something that I call News Corps. Let me tell you what a terrible branding decision this was. 
turns out there's com competition uh, in this space, so we're coming up with a better name, Journalist Corps. As in the Netherlands and the United States, there are enormous numbers of young people who are finishing school at different levels, only to discover that there are no jobs. One crucial distinction in the United States, they also have massive debt, but that's not our, an issue for us today. As I told you, there's lots of local places, cities, state houses, places that used to get covered that don't get covered so much anymore. Isn't, wouldn't one, use of, one good use of public funds be to find a way to train young people to do the most innovative and exciting narrative multimedia journalism, st you know, story-driven, interesting stuff in these places that aren't going to drive a market? training people, getting them out there, a kind of worker, working program to get young journalists out into the world for a couple of years. The United States has a very successful AmeriCorps program right now, which is to seed young people into uh, civic projects all around the country. Maybe we should think about journalism as one of the places that could use that insurgence of smart people. I want to talk about this very briefly. Computational journalism. Is this a, a phrase that rings a bell at all? Good. Here's an area which I think is actually exciting, and it picks up on things Mark said before. What if we think about the internet not just as a threat, but as the first step in a game of jujitsu, something that can be turned around for the sake of good journalism? One of the things that we have in this new digital era is access to enormous amounts of data, databases with the most interesting kinds of things you could imagine press releases from members of Congress, here's just a, a slice of things. Documents from the SEC, the Pentagon, defense contractors. There's massive amounts of data out there that journalists have never had access to before. That could be the making for an amazing story, maybe a team story done by a center or a coalition of people, maybe young people, that are now at your fingertips if you knew what to do with the keyboard. News organizations have to do a much better job of teaching young people and teaching veterans how to use the information, how to get the information that's out there and how to analyze it. And I, I just was referring you here to an article by Sarah Cohen, James Hamilton, and Fred Turner um, in a, in a uh, computer science journal on some of the things that journalists could be doing. There needs to be a new conversation about this. I just want to suggest it's one of the interesting po future possibilities for, for journalism online. Not everyone's going to do it, but a lot of people can, and amazing stories will come from it. A couple more things, and then I'll wrap up. New business models, because I agree with you that business needs to be part of it too. So just don't quote me as saying the solution's only coming from the public media. It's not. So there are a couple of really interesting entrepreneurial applications that have come out of the United States in the last year or so that are taking advantage of the public interest in really good storytelling a la Cy Hirsch, right? And here we're seeing a, a, a kind of world of applications that make it possible for good journalists who want to do independent work, who want to write engaging narratives, and who have costs for reporting um, to make money by selling their work one piece at a time. Now, this is not an ideal model. There's another one that's kind of like it called Byliner. So the Atav Atavist is one. I urge you to check these out. They're fascinating, fascinating sites, and there's great material on it. And another is called Byliner. And I'm not the kind of person who reads the PowerPoint, so I trust that you guys know how to read. Um, so these are very interesting. There's, there, there's an issue with them, which is that they tend to work really well for the high-profile journalists who already have a following. It's very hard for people to break out on them. So the big success on Byliner has been John Krakauer's expose. Do you know about the, this story, this incredible expose of this international bestseller, which went viral? Um, but it is going to be a place where young people can break out, and they're working on things that will highlight the very good stories of young people. So there are sites like this which can work, but the danger of this world is that it creates a free market nation of writers, of people who are individuated, who are on their own, who, who do this solo, 
and who don't see themselves as being part of a collective thing. And one virtue of a newsroom or an association is it does build a kind of camaraderie and a sense of professional mission, which this could somehow undermine. And finally, I just, my, my last slide about the future of news production as a business is that one great opportunity of the internet is it has allowed newspaper companies to get back into the business of breaking news. For the first time in decades, for the first time since broadcasting, newspaper companies can now break news. They, can be, they don't do it in the newspaper, they do it online, and they do it very well. So increasingly, people go to newspaper.com, the newspaper website, to try to get information about something that's just happened, and it can be very good information. And as more and more ad dollars move online, I don't see any reason why newspapers shouldn't be able to compete for them effectively so long as they're breaking news there. Thank you very much. Eric Kleinenberg. I, I want the, the, last, the last slide, well, not this one, but the one before that. Yep. The, the, the small stories. Somebody really wants to talk to you. <laughs> the, a three dollar a yeah, piece, yeah. three dollar a piece stories. Yeah. The, 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 how, how big is it? It's it's getting big. It's I mean it, I I don't know what the numbers are um, overall, but they have when they have a big story that hits, they get tens of thousands of people buying tens them. Of th tens of thousands. Tens of, of thousands people, of thousands people. So you can really build a business on that. Oh yeah. If you make one or two stories a year, a you can already make a living. Absolutely, they share their they share their revenue. I mean, I think you need that the, the stories are cheap enough. Uh, that you probably can't do one or two stories a year. You need to do more than that, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you sell a story for $2 and you're getting half of it and the journalist is getting half and there's some mm -hmm. cost for expenses you're sparing, sharing, that's not going to drive your business. Um, but a bunch of those could. Okay. The computation, computational journalism thing. Yes. How come big newspapers with large editorial staffs don't pay more attention? There's so much transparency. There's so much information available. Well, What's look, your explanation? Yeah, so I think... Uh, Breaking news, that's what you're uh, talking about. All organizations grow because they're good at a specific thing. And one of the challenges for newspapers is that they've had to learn how to be good at different kinds of things, right? And the traditional ways of reporting are very powerful and they can work in many circumstances. I, hope th uh, I don't mean to be saying we should push them aside, on the contrary. But there are new opportunities for reporting, for solving puzzles for answering questions that the internet affords that newspapers were not set up to do. So newspapers have to see the world as different and they have to recognize their own capacity to do this kind of thing. It's just hitting, right? We're just learning how uh, capable we are of accessing and analyzing databases like the ones that I've described. And I am certain that forward-thinking news organizations will be doing more of this. You started by telling us with those journalists, those famous journalists, calling you and complaining and being worried about their own future. Yeah. I said successful, not famous. <laughs> well, they were successful anyway. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and they, had, they had some results in the yeah. past and they were worried about, Absolutely. can I still make a career, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. What is it, you're, what is it and then can I, can I become an academic? That yeah. was more or less, what, what is it you tell them actually? I say, hurry up and get your application in. Hurry up and get your application in, why? Because I think it's a very tough time to be a freelance reporter. Mm. And as much as I care about the future of journalism as an institution, mm -hmm. when a, an individual calls me and says, I can't make a living, and I have a two-year-old at home, what am I gonna do for the next 20 or 30 years? Mm -hmm. I can't, with a good conscience, say to them, slug it out, because eventually, we'll get to the golden age. Mm -hmm. The truth is that this is a real problem. And individually, if I'm a journalist right now, if I'm a, if I'm a student, I'm 20 years old, I'm really wondering why I want to go and pursue a career in newspapers. I have a very hard time... In journalism, in newspapers I, maybe. I have a very, well, I'll, I'll push it even more than journalism, right. I have a very hard time understanding what journalism schools are doing these days, other than training people to go into public relations. And uh, I've taught in journalism schools, I have strong relationships with deans of, of journalism schools, and I think they're trying to innovate as well. But the truth is, there are not enough jobs in journalism to justify a $50,000 a year degree in journalism, which okay. is what students in the United States are paying. There's a gentleman here. Who, yes. Maybe you can we work for the media development long term. More importantly, rarely do we have a chance 
of having a sociologist to discuss this subject. And I want to get your, 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 your take on this, which is linked a bit to the market failure. Yeah. One of the books that was mentioned very rapidly in Frank's presentation this morning, or this afternoon rather, was uh, Rose and Steele's The Covid Book Blur. Yeah. Interestingly, at the end, he proposes a, something about future of journalism, which is, to, which is not really an answer, but a sort of a framework, which is saying, basically, we're trying to keep the question of news and journalism, by the way, just like journalism school, and actually, the real thing is about the future of knowledge. Mm. And more specifically, in the case of what journalism do, is future of civic knowledge. I'm not saying civic journalism. I'm yeah. not talk. I'm talking about the etymological yeah. right rationale. And uh, the, basically, we're just trying to put whatever for 400 years worked for business reason and for so, so, social reason, we're trying to fit a round, a round peg in a square hole. What do you think about? I mean, is it, it, do journalists have to stop back and say, "Listen, what exactly are have we been doing?" Civic knowledge. It, it's a it's a good question. Um, I am reluctant. I made this point about throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and I'm reluctant to do that here either. I, I think, for, as an outsider, I think journalism is an extraordinary profession, and it's a hard won profession. And it's a profession that is capable of producing work that has a public benefit like almost no other profession I know. And the problem in journalism, I think, you know, comes less from journal the failures of individual journalists to, to keep on doing good work. There are a lot of journalists out there doing good work than it does from the fact that we've lived, we're living through a technological revolution which has busted the business model. And it's busted the business model specifically for newspapers and for newspaper reporting. So there will, I think in, there's always going to be some number of journalists who can report for the New Yorker or the Atlantic, the really elite publications, and there'll be demand for them. But what we've lost is that magical combination of things that gave rise to this blood and guts reporting that drove kind of the, the political system th that we call democracy. So I do not want to get rid of professional journalism. I'd like news organizations to be thinking entrepreneurially and seriously about how to make a new model work. And I think also we need to think sharply about this question of how the public media plays a role and how the foundations play a role. We don't have to vote for one and kick the other off the island. We have to intelligently bring them together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Interesting for time. Eric Landenberg. Our final um